Welcome. Welcome back. And welcome to the joint gallery. Gather outside on the lawn to my left and your right uh, for a time of fellowship and refreshments after worship. Welcome to this day of our continuing re-entry. Welcome to this day of worship. I didn't plan to say this before I stood up, but uh, in the last three minutes I've decided that if any of you have anything to do with my memorial service, bring in a cello. <laughs> bring in a cello for its unique blend of melancholy, depth, promise, and joy. Bring in a cello. We brought in a cello today, Katie Chong and Christy Lau. We don't have the participants in the bulletin because we were printing so much this week, I think it, it escaped my editing. So we have, uh, identify Lynn Pop and Amanda Ketchpaw as our vocal duet today, and uh, we with many thanks. Uh, you will see Yumiko also as our assisting deacon. Thank you for being here, and we are situated here, as you probably know, between the Jewish New Year and the Day of Atonement. Between the start of school and the memorials for 911. We are situated here, not quite at the end of summer, but at the start of our new hope this year. The flowers that are behind me are from Gene Miller's memorial on Friday. We are situated here between life and death, in a place of hope and resurrection. Part of that resurrection, uh, resurrection promise, is an invitation, if you'd like, online at 1 p.m. today, online at 1 p.m. today. Uh, some folks connected with mission efforts uh, are gathering to organize uh, a congregational response to refugee resettlement in our midst, very possibly in Worcester, but the people who gather online will help us to, to determine that. So far, I, so far, I'm not aware of Newton efforts, uh, but to work on Afghan refugee resettlement and at least a, uh, a financial response to the needs in Haiti. Uh, so if you're, if you're available at 1 p.m. today, I'm pretty sure the Zoom link is on our website, and if it isn't, email me, uh, not, not the office, because uh, she's not in today, but email me, kb, kb at nhcc.net, and I'll, I will send you that link. From the psalmist to the many dimensions of Christianity with the words of our Jewish ancestry in time, across time, and in languages beyond counting, our companions, our family has said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Come, gather your many spirits as one in the hymn of traditional faith and hope. If you're able, please rise and let us sing Immortal, Invisible God, Only Wise.
please join me in the prayer of invocation and covenant. Long ago, O oh God, at the time of Noah, you made a covenant with all flesh and gave us a word and a symbol in pledge. You gave us a rainbow. Today, O oh Holy Spirit, we pray to come through every storm, care for all creatures, and renew our way in creation. Today, we pray for the new creation that is given by Jesus. Be with us in the journey, this quest and this life. Be with us in this time, for we need you, and we need each other, especially this year. Be with us in worship, in mission, and in prayer, when we are alone and when we are together. Rebuild our bury, our alliance, and a community in Christ. Renew us, refresh us, and rebuild us as your people, even in worship together. Amen. Please be seated. The Hebrew Bible reading is from Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 26, through chapter 8, verse 1. For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image of his goodness. Although she is but one, she can do all things, and while remaining in herself, she renews all things. In every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets. For God loves nothing so much as the person who lives with wisdom. She is more beautiful than the sun and excels every constellation of the stars. Compared with the light, she is found to be superior, for it is succeeded by the night, but against wisdom, evil does not prevail. She reaches mightily from one end of the earth to the other, and she orders all things well. Here ends the reading. and welcome. I am your Christian Education Director, Wendy Donnell, and I'm standing here because Jesus is my carpenter. Jesus is my handyman, and I am Jesus' handy girl. My job, along with my great committee of members, is to build a place where there is loving, and safety for all of our children. Next Sunday, we will renew our in-person friendships and relationships. We will build community in the Great Hall. On the 26th, we are going to build sandwiches, build treat bags, and make some beautiful cards. Um, during the year, we will build a quilt. We will build on our teaching, our compassion, our learning our mission and our love for God. This September, we welcome back Matthew, Rachel, and Brittany, and we also welcome to our team Amy Gilbert, which I'm very excited about. So folks, the good news is that Jesus gives us the tools we need to get through these tough times. I am going to work even harder to be your handy girl, because I believe the best repairman around is our Jewish carpenter Jesus. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us tools to pray. Help us to come to you for all that we need, and remind us to pray and to love and to be compassionate and to understand and listen to others all the time. In Jesus' name, amen.
don't go as far. We need all the tools that you have, including this one. Wendy knows that some of our congregation, some of our friends and beloved are visiting us through the cameras that are around us today, and that some of her biggest fans are out there. So welcome also to you who visit, who participate, who are present here in spirit and visually and audibly. We are glad to be together. There's a brief reading, it's all of 11 verses, that actually has three stories in it. It has a private story, an interpersonal story, and a public story. It's almost the middle of the Gospel of Mark, and it's one of the places from which scholars develop the phrase messianic secret. In Mark, Jesus several times tells people not to reveal who he is. And there's a reason for that, is we don't really fully know who he is. Even his disciples, the disciples at first hand, don't know who he is fully until the story is complete. But listen to this midpoint in the gospel. It begins in the 27th verse of the eighth chapter of Mark. And it uh, is one of five places in this gospel when we hear the phrase, on the way on the way, which is why the first church was not called Christian, it was called the way. Listen here for the word of God in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowds with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and to forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God has come with power. Thus far, the reading from the Gospel, the Gospel of Mark. I invite you with another, and now in this era we're stepping back more and more, at least for a time, to be safe. I invite you to join with me for a moment in prayer and let us pray. If it weren't for you, O God, our God, 
I would not have words to speak. We would not have had the conviction and the capability to make it through the last 18 months. We wouldn't have had the commitment to the people, the needs, the world around us in these seasons if it weren't for the way that you have inspired us and led us, taught us and empowered us. So may your word be alive in our words, in our conversations and convictions. May your word of life still share life here with us. This Recovenant Sunday, this day of resurrection today. Do all this for us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have uh, read this. Three days ago in Boston, uh, someone vandalized the 911 memorial at the Public Garden. About 3,000 American flags were planted there, and someone went in and started knocking flags over. Almost as soon as it happened, Others started putting them back up as soon as they saw the need. 18 months ago, here in this sanctuary, we learned all of a sudden that it was not safe to worship together in this room. And with about two days' notice, some of our members, well, actually Misha Hill and Rich Bryden, organized so that immediately we could worship online and they started putting us together as soon as they saw the need. 20 years ago, I was starting a brand new ministry, not here, but in West Hartford, Connecticut, and literally two days after my first presence in the church, 911 happened, and we pulled together a Tuesday evening event on what we called a day of tragedy and grief. And if you can remember it, if you can imagine it, we did this without email. We did this without a website. We really did this without much more than a couple hours notice. And in a church about the size of this one, over 70 people came out and started praying together as soon as they saw the need. Five days after that event, I preached my first real sermon in the parish, and I went off text, as they say. Instead of dealing with the gospel that morning, I told a story about visiting Siena, Italy. Some of you may have been there, where the floor of the cathedral, the Duomo, up front, on that floor there is a giant, terrifying mosaic depicting the slaughter of the innocents. From Matthew 2. Herald, Herod kills all the babies through his hate and his self-absorption. And in Siena, a, a good part of this scene is covered with cardboard so that visitors can walk over it and get back and forth. And you can only see it with very much detail if you put a coin in a light box. And when you do, horrors are illuminated, but only for a few minutes. And then the room goes back to gray when the coin expires and the lights go out. 20 years ago, in New York and Washington, D.C. and Pennsylvania, the light did not go out. The glare of evil was blinding. Evil was a flame. But by the time I had my third visit to the pulpit in about seven days, just in those few days, firefighters, engineers, metal workers, medics, and volunteers, the carpenters of faith, were searching day and night for anyone or anything that could be saved. And they kept on searching, as we all remember, even at their own peril, week after week. They sought life, if you will, while the site was still burning. The Reverend Fred McFeely Rogers, Mr. Rogers, recorded several messages for children then. 
and he repeated something that he had said before. When something bad happens, look for the helpers. Look for the helpers. Because his Presbyterian theology, our Reformed Christian theology, knows that bad things happen. So his Christian faith, our Christian faith, asks, what next? How can we help? How can God help us to help? Now, in September of 2001, I did not know that congregation very well yet. I'd been there a few days. And no one had ever been through anything quite like the terrorist attacks. But nevertheless, one of the lines of my first sermon, I reread it yesterday, was something that I realized is familiar to me, and by now it's pretty familiar to you. But I said it in a different way. I said, quote, our faith, our God, and our knowledge all agree that you cannot put hope in a tomb and expect it to decompose there. If there's one thing that makes me a Christian, if there's one thing that makes Christianity itself, it is the promise and the power of the resurrection. It's a different term than rebuild, and it's different than restoration. It's different even than renewal. But it means something for when people see a situation, when God sees a situation and replaces the flags and restores the contact and repairs what is broken and sends helpers, helpers who themselves carry the seeds and the power of new life. In the Wisdom of Solomon, which Yumiko read, we're reminded that one of God's central dimensions is not only feminine, but brilliant, engaged, sensual, and able to face down bad events. Scholars reading this passage note that a lot of Judaism is inspired by the single line, God loves nothing so much as the person who loves wisdom. Christianity is inspired by that too. But it goes on to say, against wisdom, evil does not prevail. That's our Hebrew Bible, and that's our Christian inheritance. In Mark today, Jesus is at a turning point. It's almost the exact middle of the gospel. And there are these three elements of the reading including some confusing bits. Why is it that folks are supposed to keep Jesus' identity secret? What is this messianic secret? Well, it is, it is simple there and now. This Jesus, this Son of God, can't be understood, not even by his disciples, can't be understood as Messiah until the passion, until the end of the story, even the resurrection. He's not just wise, although we know that's good. He's not just a teacher, a healer, or a friend, although those are all part of our favorite bits. He also has a cross to face and evil to overcome. And when Peter is focused on him losing his life, Jesus says, no, it's actually about me choosing my life. It's not losing, it's choosing. And he chooses to follow God even if it was hard harder or hardest. He is a helper. This is perfectly obvious, but bears saying out loud anyway. We are at a turning point on Recovenant Sunday. We're trying to re-enter the building, but we're worried that the fall may get bad. We're tired of being apart and away from normal time and we're smart enough to see that there is probably very little that is normal still ahead. Frankly, there are bad things ahead. In Afghanistan, in Haiti, in Florida, Texas, and Tennessee, from hurricanes and viruses, and in Newton, from all the revealed economic injustices, hunger, and racism. We are at a turning point. 
I'm like the psalmist. I, I, I long for the morning. I long for the things I know how to do and the ways that I know how to live. But Jesus' model is also right and true. The story of our church is alive whenever we face what is coming next, whenever we help to fix what is bad, even if we haven't detailed it yet, without a crystal ball or the clarity of all those elements. But I know this. I know this. You know this. You can't put hope in a tomb and expect it to decompose there. Hope rises and it resurrects. And we know this. There are unexpected things ahead. So let us pledge this in our recovenanting time. Let us pledge this. We will put back up what is knocked over. We will reconnect when we are separated. We will pray and face any evil that comes our way, and we will be helpers. Because wisdom, Jesus, and God are constantly with us at this turning point. They are constantly with us this fall, this winter, and eternally. They are constantly with us to the end of the story. Right? Let the people say amen. amen. I invite you to find the litany of our covenant, which is on the back side of your bulletin, and to join together. And while once upon a time, when I penned these things, I would separate folks, left and right, front and back, different gifts. There's not so much separation here now. It's about love and prayer. So, we are reminded that when Lot's wife looked back, she turned into a pillar of salt. But we can't help but look back 19 months at the strangest of strange times. We can't help but thank God that we've made it another year, as well as pray to God to lead us in the journey ahead. So in order to remember and to dream together, our ancestors said, we covenant with the Lord and with one another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in all divine ways, according as God is pleased to reveal himself unto us in the blood. This is our recurrent covenant. This covenant involves our creator. Our Christian covenant reveals why we are who we are and how we know whose we are. Once again, we praise God for the covenant that blesses us with personal voices and prophetic harmony. But this year, we pray for the ways we can sing together again, too. Even now, we strive to spread the biblical harmonies of justice and joy.
20 years ago, I wrote a three-paragraph prayer for the evening of tragedy and grief. And this is the first of those three paragraphs. O oh God, whose heart weeps at the disobedience and the suffering of any of your creatures, look upon the needs of our day and our time with justice and with mercy. Look upon us with a heart of healing. You who are champion of those who suffer, you who chastise the abuser, be now our assurance during a day of fear and doubt. Be now our shield on a night of sadness and grief. Be with us here in real presence. This is also always our invitation to prayer, that God be with us in real presence. So I invite you to pray together and to conclude our prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God of love and hope, God of resurrection and of helpers, God of carpenters, companions, wisdom, and the way, be with us as we know you through Jesus' gifts and life and hope. Be with us here today, those of us who are able to gather in the sanctuary in Newton, and those of us, friends and neighbors, beloved, afar, safe at home, online. Be with those of us who are recovering, recovering well from health care, especially Elaine and Hugh. Be with Ted's good best friend in his moments of struggle. Be with all of us who have something to name in our heart, all of us who have anything broken in our life. Therefore, be with all of us through the ways that feed us and clothe us materially and spiritually, presently and eternally. Be with us, sustaining us, as we are with others, as helpers. Be with us starting this new year, this new covenant, this unknown journey into a place where one thing that makes us certain is that you are with us always and forevermore. Be with us in that assurance, and in all else, we will be able to offer the assurance of our faith and mission and our love. Be with us, reminding us that there is power and wisdom in the ancient words that Jesus taught his disciples, including the words, Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On this day of covenant renewal, we are privileged to sing together one of Gene Miller's favorite hymns, a hymn that even swings a little bit. What a covenant. <laughs>
stained glass, through the fog, through the smoke, through the despair. May we see God's countenance shining upon us, and always and everywhere, in the Northern Hemisphere, in the Southern Hemisphere, in the Left Hemisphere, in the Right Hemisphere, in all parts of the world, in every way possible, knowing that it's against the odds, still, may God bring us peace. I invite you all to say Alleluia. And I invite you all to say Amen. Amen.